Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our global journey to NYU Florence. My name is Mary Appetit, and I'm here with the Office of Global Programs to introduce our uh, NYU Florence co-directors, Larry Wolf and Perry Class. Larry Wolf is the Silver Professor of History at New York University, Executive Director of the NYU Remarque Institute, and co-director of NYU Florence. His most recent book is The Singing Turk, Ottoman Power and Operatic Emotions on the European Stage from the Siege of Vienna to the Age of Napoleon. He's also the author of Paulina's Innocence, Child Abuse in Casanova's Venice, The Idea of Galicia, History and Fantasy in Habsburg Political Culture, Venice and the Slavs, The Discovery of Dalmatia, sorry, in the Age of Enlightenment, Inventing Eastern Europe, The Map of Civilization, On the Mind of Enlightenment, The Vatican and Poland in the Age of Partitions, and Postcards from the End of the World, Child Abuse in Freud's Vienna. His next forthcoming book is Woodrow Wilson and the Reimagining of Eastern Europe. He has received Fulbright American Council of Learned Societies and Guggenheim Fellowships, and he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Phew. <laughs> Perry Class is Professor of Journalism and Pediatrics at New York University and co-director of NYU Florence. She practices pediatrics at Bellevue Hospital. Dr. Class writes the weekly column, The Checkup for the New York Times. Her nonfiction books include Every Mother is a Daughter, co-authored with her mother, and Quirky Kids, Understanding and Helping Your Child Who Doesn't Fit In, co-authored with Eileen Costello, A Not Entirely Benign Procedure, Four Years as a Medical Student, and Baby Doctor of Pedi Pediatricians Training. Her most recent books are The Mercy Rule, a novel, and Treatment Kind and Fair, Letters to a Young Doctor. Dr. Class is the National Medical Director of Reach Out and Read, which works with uh, through pediatric primary care to promote reading aloud to young children. Extraordinary biographies. So now I'd like to hand over the program to Larry and Perry. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm, Hi. Uh, I'm Larry. I'm one of the co-directors. I'm Perry. I'm the other co-director. Um, we've spent a lot of time at NYU Shanghai. We really love the NYU Shanghai campus and community, and we're excited to have the chance to talk with you a little bit about NYU Florence um, this evening. We're, gonna, we're going to focus on the subject of fashion, which is one of the really cool things that you can study at NYU Florence. And we're going to, um, we brought two of our faculty members um, with us here to chat with us about fashion at NYU Florence, and they approach it from very different angles. Um, you can approach um, fashion at NYU Florence from the point of view of art and history, as Patricia Lorati does, or you can approach it from the point of view of marketing and business, as Marco Semaghini does in his courses. And Florence is a very interesting place to study fashion. It's the home and um, birthplace of a very important Italian fashion houses. Um, what are they, Per Gucci. Pucci. Ferragamo, um, Emilio Pucci, Enrico Coveri, oh, I think they're all founded in, in Florence, though Marco and Patricia will know better than I do. We also have a very cool fashion collection at NYU Florence. Want to say a word about that? NYU Florence is based in this amazing place, Villa La Pietra, um, a house with an incredible collection of art that was created by a couple at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, the Actons, um, and Hortense Mitchell Acton, who was an American woman who married a man from England, loved fashion. And we have her dresses that she went to Paris sometimes to buy um, at an amazing French um, designer as well. You're going to hear about that, but it's a very personal collection of the art that they loved and also the fashion that she collected and wore. So let me just say a few words about our, uh, about the two um, faculty members you're going to hear from now, um, uh, Professor Patricia Lorati and Professor Professor Marco Semaghini. Um, Patricia Lorati is an art historian who trained in Florence and at the University of Zurich. She teaches our course on fashion history at NYU Florence. And she um, recently in 2019 curated a really interesting fashion exhibit at Palazzo Pitti in Florence on animalia fashion about the ways in which fashion intersects with the 
animal world and how we would think about fashion in relation to the animal world. As I said, she's an art historian who focuses on the art of textiles, fabrics, clothing, fashion, and that's what she brings um, to our courses at NYU Florence. Marco Samaghini comes at fashion from a very different angle, from the angle of business and marketing. He's worked at important Italian fashion houses. He's worked at Gucci, he's worked at Tom Ford, he's worked at Canali, he's worked in product development, marketing and merchandising, and creative design. And um, his courses would bring you that very different angle on fashion. So I'm going to turn this over to Patricia first to say a few words, then to Marco, and then we'll all chat together. Patricia, thanks so much for doing this with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for your introduction. And I just would like to add one thing that very often Marco and I have, um, you know, the same students follow both courses because it's a very good um, interaction. I, I, I mean, it's something very interesting for the student to, you know, uh, learn the different perspective about fashion. So I'm just going to give you some highlights about my course using some images. And now I'm going to share. Um, okay. So, um, of course, there will be actually there are two section session that are on Renaissance fashion because we are in Florence. That uh, you know, it's maybe one of the most important cities for uh, Renaissance, and. Um, we usually this lesson is um, I, I have a selection of paintings from the Uffizi and I show the students all, you know, um, the evolution of fashion from when the fashion was born, which is mid uh, 14th century, and we go till the end of the 16th century. And this helps me to um, show the students how fashion was not only very important because we will see all the different styles and the fabrics and the production of fabrics in, in Florence, which was extremely important for the city, but it also gives us the um, way to to see how fashion used to convey meanings to the people. So it was a way to show power and wealth during the Renaissance. And I, th I think still today it's the same, but we are not so used to us, they were in the Renaissance to um, understand these meanings at first glance. Then I have, for example, one lesson is on fashion and body. So uh, all the modification that were used, th there were a lot of other structures that were used uh, to modify the body. And this is a very interesting um, lesson, I think, because we will see how for centuries, uh, men and women used to modify their body. And, um, and this was a way of showing status because if you modify your body, and it's difficult to walk around if you can do it with elegance means that you belong to a very high status and also that you don't have to work because it's not very easy to go around wearing a dress like that one that you can see in the image. Another topic is fashion and gender. And I think this is the most iconic image just to start my lesson on fashion and gender because still today, uh, when we look at design, we immediately associate gender to a way of dressing. So men wear trousers and women wear skirts. And we will go through the centuries and see how uh, fashion was closely connected to um, gender issues. And then, of course, as um, Perry and Larry mentioned, at Villa La Pietra, there is an amazing collection of uh, the Caloser, uh, which was a very important fashion house that opened uh, at the end of the 19th century in uh, Paris. And Hortense Mitchell Acton, she loved the dresses. So um, she used to go there in Paris and buy dresses. Actually, uh, Villa La Pietra owns I think 20 dresses of uh, the Caloser. And it's a very important collection because only other very big museum like the Metropolitan Museum, the FI, FIT Museum in New York or the Kyoto Costume Institute own these kind of dresses. And here you can see, and another important thing is that um, Hortense Hatch action 
Acton was a very faithful customer of the Calosa. So we can see dresses. We have dresses at Ville La Pieta that goes from the beginning of the uh, 20th century till the around the 1930s. So it's very important because we can see also the evolution of fashion uh, during these years. So you can see there is a 1910 evening gown, a 1914 evening dress. And then we have, for example, a 1925-26 evening dress and the 1929. This is very interesting for the students. There will be also um, a lesson on the exhibition that I created, the one that um, Larry mentioned, which was then called Animalia Fashion. And this is a way for me to um, share with the students how you plan, how you set up and, you know, um, an exhibition that I think it's something very interesting because it's kind of uh, behind the scene, a backstage. And I'm going to show the, them a picture that they are taking when, you know, the exhibition was, we were setting up uh, the exhibition. Of course, we will talk about Futurism, which was a, a very important um, art movement in Italy, and they also dealt in some way uh, with fashion. This is a drawing by Giacomo Balla of um, a men's suit. Uh, you know, the Futurist, it's very interesting, but uh, it, was not, it, it was not such a, a popular fashion, but it's very interesting for the ideas. And then Elsa Schiaparelli, uh, who was uh, an Italian fashion designer, but she worked uh, in Paris and she was so famous and she worked with many surrealist artists and especially uh, Salvador Dali, for example, this is called the skeleton dress and was, um, you know, a collaboration between uh, Elsa Schiaparelli and Salvador Dali. And then there is also um, a lesson on uniform and working clothes. And so we'll see how uh, uniforms uh, still uh, influence fashion today. For example, you see, we see in the, in the black and white image, you can see French sailors in their working uniform. And then you can see an image of an evening dress by Jean-Paul Gaultier. And, you know, we will see the sailors uniforms, the soldiers uniforms, and also the use of denim that was, you know, started as um, working clothes. And then now it's very, very fashionable to wear jeans. And of course, there will be a lesson on Emilio Pucci. Uh, there still is his building, his Renaissance palace in Florence. And he was so important. And he, he was very, you know, he studied in, in the United States. And then he returned to, um, to Florence. And so there is this strict connection uh, between Emilio Pucci and, and the United States. And, um, and he was a very important and innovator. He was a kind of revolutionary fashion designer for that time. Okay, that's it. <laughs> I hope I was not too long. And then if you have some question, we can go back later. Thank you. That was really, that was really beautiful. So let me turn it over to you, Marco. Go ahead. Uh, so good morning, everybody. I like to start saying that, you know, because, uh, uh, as Patricia said, we, we share a lot of students uh, and uh, actually our courses are not so different uh, as uh, uh, you could imagine in the sense that fashion is, is a language that is evolving and uh, uh, like in the past uh, was a language we was talking uh, especially about like class or status or or, or power, well, uh, nowadays it's more about self-expression, about individuality. So it's a totally different point of view, but still united by this concept of language. I like to explain that my course, uh, Global Fashion Industry Italy, that actually is a kind of complex uh, uh, title, is, uh, you know, is, is, is based on oxymoron. So I scare my students from the beginning saying it's based on, uh, on oxymoron. The first, uh, oxymoron is the concept of fashion and industry in the sense that we associate fashion to 
creativity uh, to freedom uh, to uh, you know pure uh, exuberance sometimes you know even excessivity but the fashion that we know is always made by uh, people with a different uh, approach so in the pictures that i'm showing uh, uh, you see some of the uh, let's say legendary Italian designers from Valentino to Armani to Versace uh, to Miuccia Prada or American designers such as Tom Ford that actually um, were for Gucci, so for an Italian brand in the past and you know the current creative director of Gucci, Alessandro Michele, but in the same picture we always see you know another character, Giancarlo Giammetti, Sergio Galeotti, Marco Bizzari now, Patrizia Bertelli. So the kind of strategic or uh, organization mind behind the success of the business. So every um, fashion that we know is always made by the combination of a vision, of a talent and um, of a strategic approach of an industry. And the other Oxymoron is global and Italy. What is global? What is Italian? This is something that we try to learn in our course. Gucci is actually, you know, yes, of course, it's an Italian, sorry, is an Italian brand, is based in Italy, is one of Italian pride, but technically Gucci is a French brand because it's owned by a French um, luxury holding, caring. Uh, the same holding that owns Balenciaga, for instance, but is made in Italy the same old that owns, uh, you know, Alexander McQueen, but other brands such as Vuitton, quintessential French, have their own facilities, especially for leather goods here in Italy. This is the, the Vuitton manufacturing facility for shoes, as you can easily imagine, in, um, in Veneto. So what is Italian and what is global? What is uh, a national pride and what is international. This is actually an object of study to understand what is behind the formula of made in Italy. What does it mean made in Italy? Manufactured in Italy? Produced in Italy? It's not easy to give an answer because this is a formula that you know a lot of people say it, but you know it's difficult to open uh, the box and to see what's, uh, what's, uh, what, what's in. And that's what actually this is what actually we try to do in our course, because Made in Italy is actually a, a, a mix of meanings, a layering of meanings that moves from the myth of Italy, that is exactly what Patricia has uh, explained, talking about Renaissance, so the splendor of the golden age uh, of Italy, that of course in Florence uh, finds one of its uh, epitome, one of its best uh, representations. The fact that Italy has traditions like the textile industry or fine tailoring, the Neapolitan school, for instance, the craft traditions, uh, the leather accessories that find in the Tuscany area one of their districts, uh, but is a peculiarity of Italy, the fact that there are regional uh, areas specialized in some production, in some category. Tuscany is specialized, especially in, in, in leather, from the tanneries to the manufacturing. The fact that Italy has, uh, the Italian model is based on uh, small to medium size companies that actually was, were able to create uh, synergies through integration, through connection, so economies of scale. So mixing the pluses of being small, of being flexible with the pluses of being organized in, uh, in a network. Uh, made in Italy means research, means uh, um, quick response and customization. So mm, closeness to, to, to market, uh, to, um, to the market needs and continuous innovation. Uh, Italian people are never happy, whatever we, we look, we are never satisfied. We always want to find something that is better and better of what we do now. Um, and this is our culture of industrial design. Everything started with uh, industrial, I mean, with the furniture design, but this model has quickly uh, evolved from industrial design to fashion design. The creativity is, of course, is important, but as you see, it's just one element of the multiple elements that create uh, the concept of made in Italy. Each one of these is relevant, each one of these is important. Um, not a single one is, is enough. And then, of course, we 
try to move from, you know, where Patricia ends, so the birth of a Made in Italy here in Florence. This is a beautiful uh, image of the Sala Bianca in Palazzo Pitti, where the modern concept of fashion was actually born after the Second World War, uh, through, you know, the in legendary names, uh, like Georgian names that, you know, correspond to also a new concept of being a designer, not just the couturier of the past, but people like Giorgio Armani, the Gianni Versace, that uh, work uh, close to the industry and close to the market, down to, you know, the, let's say, the power of the historical brand in the 90s, uh, Prada and Gucci. Uh, that are Florentine brand. Gucci is 100% Florence, or was, as I said, 100% Florence. Prada is 50% in the sense that we're Mucha Prada. Uh, the creative director is a quintessential Milanese. The uh, facilities, the production, the know-how, the manufacturing is here in Tuscany, a few kilometers south uh, of, of, uh, of Florence. And we follow the evolution of this brand, not just in terms of a case study, but in terms of understanding what's behind, what's really uh, behind the success, but also the fall of, uh, of these brands across the, the decades. And we also try to have a kind of playful attitude. This is a screenshot from the David Wars Prada. So we try to mix different media in order to keep the attention of our students uh, alive. Um, as uh, uh, Larry Pad uh, said at the beginning, uh, it, there is a strong uh, focus on marketing uh, because uh, uh, organization in fashion uh, often corresponds to marketing, but we also, so we, through, you know, we also understand what the marketing of creativity, that these are mood boards, students are encouraged to develop their own mood board for a fashion brand through distribution. This is an example of a brilliant uh, uh, Florentine store, Luisa Via Roma, that was able to evolve itself from a brick and mortar to a um, e-commerce uh, example through uh, communication. Again, Gucci is showing uh, you know, images of uh, uh, of one of the palaces of Gucci in Via delle Caldaie through marketing. This is an example of uh, Moncler and what marketing can say um, for a brand. Uh, and of course, because we are in Florence, the connection with art, but it's a very different approach to art. Uh, these are the uh, legendary <laughs> museums uh, that we have in Florence, the Gucci Garden, you know, they don't want to be called museums, that they are not a museum, but they are a garden of creativity, but also the Ferragamo space, which is actually great for showing uh, exhibitions, like the one that I will present in a second, but also the Fondazione Prada, which is in Milan, and, uh, you know, fingers crossed, when the travels will be possible again, we actually bring our students to Milan, it's only two hours from, um, from Florence, to visit different uh, realities. So Ferragamo is not only the uh, creator of, uh, you know, icons uh, such as the rainbow shoes, and it's not only another Florentine uh, pride, but it's also, uh, I mean, sorry, this is another image, Gucci, and the Prada, so all the, let's say, leather goods houses based in Florence, but it's also, um, as I said, the host of important uh, exhibition, like the one that I just mentioned, sustainable thinking, because we like to close uh, our course uh, with a not so positive note, what I, what I call the dark side of fashion, which is uh, an aspect that we cannot ignore, the fashion, fashion is, uh, also, it's not just uh, sparkle and uh, and success and uh, uh, and rifleness, but it's also you know pollution. It's also exploitation, but it's also the solutions to that. Fashion is flexible. Fashion is reacting, and we try to see what is the Italian uh, position in this very complex but very important uh, subject. Okay. <laughs> in a few minutes, in a few words, this was uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, my cause. So we're here. 
Marco, Patricia, those were both brilliant presentations and really beautiful and fascinating to watch. And I think gives everyone an idea of these two very different but complementary approaches to thinking about fashion as art and history on the one hand, point of view of business and marketing on the other hand. Um, one of the things that we can do now for the first time at NYU Florence is we can have hands-on internships for students with, that's been created as a possibility. One of the things that I was remembering, Patricia, is that we had students involved this past semester in bringing out the Calosur dresses and um, presenting them on the mannequins um, in relation to the course that you were teaching. I wondered whether you each would say a few words about the kind of projects the students um, get involved with in your courses over the course of the last couple of years, either as research projects or as um, practical visits in Florence. Are there things that come to mind that you'd want to mention to the Shanghai community? I go first? Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, actually, when it was possible, uh, after, you know, my lesson on Renaissance fashion, we used to visit the Uffizi and so, you know, see uh, the real paintings and all the details. So it was a kind of, you know, I, before I took the lesson and then it was a kind of practical lesson with the students looking at the paintings and just, you know, trying to find what they've learned in the previous lesson. And then another very important um, visit is the one at the Prato Textile Museum, which is an amazing place because it actually, now it's a museum, but before it actually was a textile uh, manufacturing. So the building is very interesting. And what I also like, there is a, um, a room where the, there are all the fibers that were used for fabrics. And so the student can look and touch the fabrics and actually they also own a, an amazing collection of Renaissance uh, fabrics, not only Renaissance. So this is very important. And, um, and then usually we go to Palazzo Pitti because there is the fashion and costume museum and there used to be, you know, every, usually every six months, there is a new exhibition. So, and I hope there will be very soon another one. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as my course is concerned, uh, uh, we, again, we have to speak of like, pre-lockdown conditions and we always try to make it as interactive as possible. Of course, uh, it's not about, I mean, probably you see where I am now, it's actually a, a laboratory where students learn to make shoes, where not organized yet in NYU, but we are, uh, we are, I mean, at least we try to, to follow the processes and especially we used to go in um, one of these service uh, laboratory that actually create uh, the uh, industrialization of, uh, uh, of clothes. There is a strong process from the design to the making and selling. Um, of, um, of an item, of a garment, that, you know, people tend to ignore. Um, and actually we go there, we see where actually the, 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 the clothes become real. Uh, they move from being just a sketch um, by designer and they, they become uh, a three-dimensional prototype and a sample uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so we really see where um, the things become true. And then we have a chance to explore brands. So through visits to the Gucci Garden, which is not just, an, Gucci Garden is a very interesting reality because it's not just an exhibit of uh, historical pieces of, uh, of an historical brand, but is actually an effort to define what is a brand, uh, what kind of uh, meanings, uh, what kind of, uh, um, questions also they pose to the why do we buy something? What is really attracting us to the brand? So it's a very uh, complex process that uh, um, um, that we go through when we visit the, uh, the the Gucci Museum, the Gucci Garden Museum, and then you know the Ferragamo exhibit, as I said, that are always interesting, and again they're always showing um, aspects of uh, fashion industry that are connected to Ferragamo, but the focus is not on Ferragamo. Ferragamo is the host. The focus is on 
an aspect, which can be the art, like in a power exhibition of two years ago, or sustainability, like the one was running now, and, uh, and so on. The students uh, are encouraged to do projects. Um, we don't, I, I, I don't do exams. I don't really like exams. <laughs> so we make projects, projects that are of different nature. A project can be the construction of a mood board for a given brand. A important project can be the relaunch of a brand that maybe was glorious in the past. An example that um, Larry mentioned is, is Enrico Covery, a name that was really brilliant in the, the 80s and, you know, for different reasons, is forgotten now. Uh, is it possible to relaunch it? One, another one is as a Schiaffarelli, like uh, the, the, the legendary couturier that, that Patricia has mentioned. So the students are encouraged to uh, to see if we can do, can we do something? <laughs> so can we relaunch this brand? Can we transform these brands from something from the past into something that is relevant for uh, to the new generations? Uh, but, but, but what else? An analysis, an analysis of the retail environment, mm -hmm. what makes it similar and or different from the retail environment that um, you're familiar with in your own countries. And uh, more or less, that's it. <laughs> I might forget something. Uh, of course, we try to be interactive even in this, uh, can I say, hybrid, city hybrid situation. It's difficult, but we try. Ah, and something that both uh, Patricia and, and I forgot to say, we try to invite people. Uh, in presence when possible or via Zoom, that is one of the few things that Zoom makes easier, to invite people from, from the industry, from different areas, to, to, to have seminars, to, to speak to our students, uh, to bring their own experience, uh, um, very informal uh, conversations that uh, for me are available. So it's really bringing people that made the, that or are making the history of, or of the fashion industry, um, creating contact with, uh, with the students. Um, I hope that students are getting a sense of the many different ways, um, both in person and taking advantage of virtual technology, that they can interact with with fashion, with the history of fashion, with the industry and the production of fashion through what you've created, through the internships that Larry mentioned. I wonder if you want each to give an example or two of the kinds of projects that students have done in your class, the kinds of research or interests that they've been able to pursue. So I, I, I can tell you about this semester that um, we, because it was not possible to go to visit Villa La Pietra, um, we had a webinar on the Hortense um, Act on Dresses and, you know, um, the collection manager, uh, Francesca Baldry and the textile conservator, uh, Claudia Bayer, they show they, they, they just gave an introduction to Hortense Acton, and then um, the textile conservation conservator uh, show us some of the dresses and shoes that belong to um, Hortense. And now um, our students will be working on groups, of course, online between them, and they have to do some research on these dresses, which are not being studied so much. Uh, actually, there is no, there is not, no book about uh, the Calosur, which is very unusual, I think, but um, so they have to do some research. You know, it's not easy, but I think it could be very, very interesting for them. Uh, of course, we help them. We provide some texts that can be useful. They can ask a, a you know, um, question to the textile conservator, and then they will give um, a class presentation. So this is one of the projects. And, and another thing that was very funny, uh, I think was in not the last semester, but the one before, um, after I gave you know, the lesson on my exhibition, Animalia Fashion, I asked the students to find a contemporary dress um, that was inspired by an animal. And uh, 
and you know a music or a song that you know mentioned the animal and then at the end of the course uh, the digital studio uh, put together all the images and the music and there was such you know the result was such a very nice video and so i like very much this uh, project too yeah I mean, one thing that I, I always say at the beginning to my students is that forget to work for Gucci, that what everybody wants, but you know, Gucci doesn't accept any internship. So it's better to be clear from the beginning, but we can do something in between. And for instance, one thing that was actually challenging, especially for uh, the American students, uh, not so much for the Chinese students, but was like to um, not just to compare the retail experience, but actually to analyze from life. So they were supposed to, uh, to visit some stores and uh, to, you know, make questions and to analyze the behavior of the sales staff or the uh, the knowledge, how much they are prepared, and kind of, and to you know, this, um, classify the, the the stores, and and I used to go to the store managers after saying, you know, you got a good grade or you didn't get a good grade, but it was fun, and actually a couple of students also was offered the job that uh, you know, make uh, in Gucci, by the way. Uh, that they couldn't accept because of the visa, of course, <laughs> but they were brilliant in the way they used to interact with the team. Uh, again, as I said, you know, all these things are more difficult We are doing something not so interactive now for obvious reasons, but, you know, as soon as the things uh, go, we will go back to this kind of uh, of interaction. And again, when we visit the Gucci garden, it's not just about, uh, you know, looking, and, but it's about understanding and about making questions, about making research, it's about, you know, also because I've worked in Gucci for 10 years, basically. So I know I have a little things, a couple of things about it, and I can provide insight um, to their to their questions. So more or less, this is what we do. Would you say a few words about how you yourselves became involved with fashion, with the fashion world? What was, I mean, I'm sure it's something that students think about. What are the kinds of life trajectories that take you into the fashion world from your in, in, in very different points of view, right, for your, for your two cases? Um, would, you, would you talk a little bit about how the fashion became an important part of your life? Do you really want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Patricia, oh, so I need to you. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, as uh, Larry mentioned before, I'm art historian. So I, I, I took a degree in art history. And then my master, I started to get involved into fashion with my master, which was on the Renaissance dresses. And then I don't know why or how I jumped into contemporary fashion and I just prepared an, a project for an exhibition and it was accepted by the Uffizi Gallery. And so I was more involved in, in, uh, in fashion. And, uh, and it's something that I really like and I keep studying and I keep learning things. And I, I, I think art history now is a little bit less important and I'm, I'm really involved in, in, uh, in fashion because what what is really important, I think, fashion, when you study it, you will understand how fashion um, during the century and still today affect our lives every day. And so it's very important. Uh, and sometimes it's very underestimated, the, the importance of fashion. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I can confirm that. Uh, but in my case, uh, uh, again, I always had passion for fashion. I have a certain age. And uh, uh, when it was the time to, 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 to make really important decisions in your life, fashion in Italy was uh, literally booming. It was the beginning of the 80s. It was the age of uh, early Versace, of Giorgio Armani, Ferré. And it was something totally different from what is now. Less business, more creativity. Mm -hmm lot of creativity, but that was a little, was a little bit scaring my family. 
saying, you know, fine, it, fashion is a passion, but no, you cannot work for them. It's too crazy. It's too like circles or something. So I, uh, I took studies in business administration. And uh, after the degree, I said, yes, but I love fashion. <laughs> so, you know. so I was trying, I always try to, to find a way of blending these two elements, you know, my studies and, and my passions. And I was lucky enough, I started as a buyer for um, a department store chain, a very important one in Italy. And buyer is an interesting, we studied, by the way, in our course, uh, the role of, um, uh, of buyers uh, as a marketing role, but actually as a role that really blends the vision and numbers, believe, uh, uh, understanding fashion and managing uh, projections and numbers. And so, on. so that was the beginning and then, you know, the different steps arrived. Um, so I found myself, but I must say, honestly, I look for it. I was really trying to use my, uh, my background for fashion. That became, you know, I say easier and easier because fashion was becoming more organized, new roles were coming up. So uh, I became a category manager, head of a product and so on, because fashion was evolving. The fashion companies were having structures that 20 years before were not really possible. So this is my, uh, my thought. But fashion is also, well, probably every job, but it's in fashion, you need a lot of passion because fashion, yes, can be crazy, it can be difficult to, to understand, can have very difficult or, uh, can I say, uh, rhythm, a uh, lot of pressure, a lot of stress. Uh, uh, you have to love it. Uh, you have to have passion. It's not something that you do just for doing it. Uh, and uh, and this is also the reason why I teach now, because after so many years in the fashion of industry, I realized that, you know, my, I was saying, doing, repeating, always the same things, where when I teach every time, every course, uh, every class is different. So I love it. I found the passion that I was a little bit losing um in the in the industry so that's the answer <laughs> at the end probably the key word is passion <laughs> passion for fashion and probably passion for teaching thank you both so much that was inspirational um marianne there are some questions from the students who are in the webinar would you yes there's some questions um let me start with but first of all i want to say thank you so much this was so exciting and extraordinary and just really you know just wonderful. And Patricia, I wish I could see that installation. Your exhibition looks amazing, just absolutely <laughs> beautiful. Um, one thing that you've both alluded to is just the impact that COVID has had on your teaching and also in fashion. And when I think of fashion, it is such an in-person industry in terms of every aspect of it, right? From, from because it's tactile, it's in person, the collections, the shows, all of that. What has the pandemic, what are some of the impacts of the pandemic on the industry, if you can talk about that. And are there any things that you see that might actually uh, be lasting impacts that might be positive changes or not? Yeah. Yeah. There are many. I mean, you're, you're, it's not, it's not uh, um, an easy question, but of course there are many, starting from the technicalities. Something is uh, uh, under the eyes of everybody, fashion has to find uh, uh, new ways uh, to communicate. Communication is everything in fashion. Fashion doesn't exist if you don't show it, if you don't uh, make it visible. And, uh, uh, and uh, every brand had to find a new way of communicating. That at the beginning uh, was uh, uh, meant like, okay, something temporary just because we cannot go back to our you know, traditional fashion show. But, um, with uh, time, it's becoming the research of new ways that probably nobody knows, of course, but they might remain because mm -hmm. they proved to be successful now, but maybe successful forever, especially for some 
uh, new target for some new generations. That are, there are brands that are showing on game platform that I had to learn. I never heard before. So, and through gaming, uh, you present a collection, something that some generation, especially the young people, are uh, uh, loving or TikTok, uh, something like that, that was totally out of the radar until two years ago. And now is one of the main tool or it's becoming one of the main tools for some brands to communicate. They're finding new way for selling because, uh, you know, fashion is a tridimensional thing. It's a tactile thing. You have to try, you have to touch, you can't. What do you do? And you do everything with new tools that are improving the, the, the 3D experience in a way that is replacing the right one, the, the, the traditional one, the, the physical one. So the showrooms are online now. People see the collection online. Um, this, has, uh, this is something that probably might remain in the sense that of course it's cutting costs in terms of the travels, in terms of uh, uh, you know, expenses, in terms of moving around the world just to stay two days in Paris to make an order. Uh, so something might remain because it's more efficient. Um, but, and this is probably the, the, the key aspect, uh, is also changing, uh, what did we say at the beginning? Fashion is a language and the language is something that evolved. We are not using the same word that we are, use, we are, you know, uh, we are using 20 years ago. And especially the people that is 20 years old is not using the language that we, <laughs> we could use at their own age. And of course, you know, it was already in the air at leisure, a certain kind of, you know, uh, casual attitude or, you know, you've seen where we moved, you've seen the, 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 the panier skirt <laughs> in the beautiful image of Patricia. That was not 2000 years ago, it was like 200 years ago. So, and now it's all about comfort, uh, but comfort in a glamorous way. And of course, pandemic has uh, stressed and improved this kind of casualty. You know, mm -hmm. I'm wearing trousers not here, but no, we know we're not supposed to. We can even wear in a much more easy or casual or comfortable or personal way. So, but, People do not give up. It's not because we are spending time, more time at home, that we are not dressing up or not finding a way of dress. No, no, we're just finding different ways, mm. uh, alternative ways. But, you know, people or lots of people, especially new generation, it's their moment. And they, they are finding new ways of buying, new ways of, uh, of, uh, of wearing. And think so it's under our eyes. I don't know if I've answered <laughs> your point. Patricia, do you want to add something? Well, actually, this is more your topic. I'm more <laughs> historical, but <clears throat> I was just yeah. thinking, I, I don't know if I'm true, but I was just thinking one positive thing about this pandemic is that maybe. Um, fashion shows are become more democratic. I mean, everyone can watch a fashion show right now. Um, yes. You know, before you had to be invited, and it was very difficult. And now they are online, uh, and you can access. A, you know, not after one week, but just mm -hmm. the same when it's going on. So I, I, I was just thinking this as a positive aspect. Absolutely that. true. But the point is, it's, it's even more than that in the sense that fashion industry, fashion as a language is a sponge, you know, it's absorbing, it's living in the society. Uh, a critique that, you know, fashion is something made somewhere else just for rich people. No, I mean, it depends on what is our perspective, but there is fashion for everybody. Everybody uh, finds his own language. And, uh, and the new generations are more and more attentive to values that are the values of inclusivity. So the fact that fashion shows are open and visible to everybody is an important aspect, it's one of the aspects. Fashion is talking to everybody, not just to a certain mm -hmm. social it class, to a certain yeah. body type. So body positivity, inclusivity, sustainability, all uh, very important social aspect that fashion has absorbed and made its own and probably, you know, transforming into a new flag, a new way of 
um, a new identity. So yes, this is actually important. Absolutely important. And and of course, pandemic has pushed these aspects, uh, these values that are behind uh, what we wear. And this is why we uh, pay a lot of attention to the sustainable aspect. Because yes, the dream is a dream, but we must understand uh, the costs of this dream. Mm. Can you speak more to that? Because I know the fashion industry, like many industries, has um, you know has come under fire for its environmental impact and so. Uh, yes, it's a, that's a, that's a, as I said before, it's at the same time environmental and uh, uh, ethical, which is something that you know some people tend to forget. There was a long, uh, um, like something that everybody was saying that fashion is the second polluting industry in the world. Actually, it's not true <laughs> in the sense that no one is taking credit on that for that sentence. So we don't know exactly what is the ranking of fashion in the polluting industries, but it is a polluting industry because this is, uh, uh, you know, the traditional way of manufacturing. It includes, it, it's, it's based on, you know, water, especially water consumption, and uh, the fact that it's a transnational uh, uh, industry. So, you know, there are a lot of movement around the world for making a pair of sneakers and so on. But it's also, and this is uh, uh, especially connected to fast fashion, is also connected to um, to to costs, and uh, and unfortunately. Fashion has opened up uh, the, 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 the doors uh, to a new kind of slavery, not only in uh, places where we can associate, uh, you know, uh, like uh, Pakistan, or, you know, I think that everybody remembers the Rana Plaza uh, accident that caused the death of uh, more than 1,000 people, but it's actually here in Prato, 20, where the beautiful Prato Textile Museum is, uh, is also a city. I mean, I'm not explaining it now, but is hosting a community of uh, people that actually work on sweatshops and uh, ignoring or avoiding every uh, legal protection. We, we had our Rana Plaza, we had fires that actually killed a lot of people that was closed in the factor. Um, so it's at the same time uh, environmental and, uh, and uh, uh, ethical. What is true is that uh, in a, literally in a couple of years, uh, even less, no one in fashion can ignore this aspect anymore. That's what they did for many, oh, apologies, oh, sorry, and you know, going on as you know, business as usual, no. Now it's not possible. There is not only more transparency, more control, but especially more attention, especially from the young generation. So there is not a single new brand, emerging brand, that can even pretend to exist without a sustainable approach. Is let me tell you, it's impossible to be 100% sustainable because the complexity of the industry is. But it's possible to make very visible improvements. Uh, under this point of view. And the young people want that, both as a customer and as makers. And, and we know, you know, only when the customers react, uh, the industry <laughs> obey. So finally, they have to do what it was already in the air. It has been in the air for ages, but now they are seriously reacting because the customer, the new generations want, they pay attention, they control. Um, what is in uh, the wardrobe, the composition, what's behind, and they have alternatives that they didn't have, and they happen to like these alternatives. So it's more, I mean, honestly, Italy, because it's based on uh, high quality and uh, serious tradition, is probably less impacted than other countries, uh, like America, for instance. Uh, but still, you mean, no one is innocent here, not even Italy. <laughs> and, uh, and in a way, it's something that uh, it's important to know. The fact that it's Italian or non-Italian is less important than the fact is it's something crucial happening now. And by the way, this is one of the occasions where I invite 
uh, kind of expert uh, under this uh, point of view because there's a situation that is evolving also legally very quick. And, uh, and so I like to invite experts <laughs> for that. Well, thank you all so much. This has been such an extraordinary hour and I can't wait to actually be able to come back to Florence and see you all in person. Um, but we're wrapping up we the hour, so thank you. And I think we're going to start the slide deck again just to give everyone more information again or repeat information about NYU Florence. So thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. And by the way, I had to leave. I have a lesson right now. So oh <laughs> thanks goodness. everybody. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you, us. everyone. And Enjoy the rest of your day. Your Enjoy your day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you. Take care. I'm going to end it. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Hey, hey.